Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Giverts. I'm a cardiologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. I'm the medical director of the Heart Transplant and Mechanical Circulatory Support Program, and I'm a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. I want to welcome you this morning to Clot Chronicles. The topic for our conversation will be on marijuana use in patients with cardiovascular disease. Now, you might ask, why does a heart transplant cardiologist have a particular interest in this area? And as uh, I think you'll understand as we talk a little bit more, um, this topic comes up uh, very frequently in patients, particularly younger patients that we evaluate for advanced therapies, including mechanical support and heart transplant, as it may impact on their ability to adhere to their treatments after transplantation and to continue to do well following their transplant. But for today's discussion, I'm going to really focus on a more general discussion of marijuana use in patients with cardiovascular disease. And this comes out of some work that I recently did with my colleagues, a paper that we published earlier this year in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, really a state-of-the-art review on this topic. The first author is a, a fellow a colleague at Columbia, uh, Dr. Ursulia de Filippis, and the senior author is my colleague here at the Brigham, Dr. Mutu. Vaduganathan. So I want to call your attention to that. I'm going to um, point out some of the uh, important things we mentioned in our paper. So the first point I'd like to make, and I think most of you are well aware of, is the marked increased use of marijuana and marijuana products in the United States and the health issue that this has really become. For those of you who are not familiar with it, Recreational marijuana is now legal in 11 states, including the District of Columbia, and medical marijuana is legal now in 33 states for a variety of uh, uses, including for patients with anorexia, for example, cancer patients to treat chronic pain or treating anxiety, as well as other specific conditions such as seizure disorders or muscle spasms. Now, the laws vary, of course, from state to state, which leads to a lot of really uncertainty in this area, both for clinicians and as well as for our patients. Now, one of the things that we know is that if you watch the news, vaping has become incredibly common in the United States, particularly among younger adults and even within uh, the teenage population. And there are many new products that are available, both again, legally and illegally. The other important point is that the potency of some of these new products, particularly some of the synthetic cannabinoids can be nearly a hundredfold more potent than what we would think of as typical marijuana. The other important point to make is that this is really a huge business. It's estimated that by next year, the uh, total sales of, of marijuana will reach over $25 billion in the United States. And uh, so there are obviously a huge interests in this area. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the specifics of the different products. It is important to mention that all of the CBD products can impact on the CBD receptors, the cannabinoid receptors, and these are located really throughout the body, including, of course, in the brain, uh, in the endocrine system, where they can impact on appetite, uh, as well as in the GI system, and particularly in the cardiovascular system, as we're discussing this morning. So there are cannabinoid receptors in myocytes, in vasoendothelial cells, as well as uh, on smooth muscle cells. Now, in our uh, paper in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, we point out that recent health surveys state that over 40 million Americans report either current or use of marijuana products within the last year and more than 80 million Americans report either current or any prior use of marijuana products. And we go on to estimate that probably more than 2 million persons in the United States with underlying cardiovascular disease have also reported either current or prior marijuana use. So it really is a, a huge problem. Now, one of the important points that we've made, and I would like to highlight this morning, are the potential cardiovascular effects, the mechanisms of action of marijuana products. And again, we have a very nice figure in our paper that points to this, but there are really five. Um, the first is concurrent hazards. So patients who uh, use marijuana products uh, may also use other tobacco products. They may have alcohol use disorder and they may use other drugs of abuse. So first is concurrent hazards. 
The second is platelet activation. There is uh, scientific evidence that marijuana can activate platelets and therefore potentially increase the risk of myocardial infarction and stroke. Third is uh, effects on oxidative stress. In vitro and animal models, it's been shown that marijuana products can increase oxidative stress and therefore have direct impact on, uh, for example, peripheral arterial disease. Fourth is uh, the effect on the adrenergic nervous system. So marijuana products can increase heart rate and blood pressure and have been associated with risk of arrhythmias, particularly atrial fibrillation. And finally, which is an area that I'm particularly interested in, is the effect of marijuana or marijuana products on the myocardium, so direct myocardial effects. And there are case reports of uh, both stress cardiomyopathy as well as toxic myocarditis. Now, one of our roles as cardiovascular disease specialists is also to think about the medications that our patients take and how other medications or products can affect those drugs. And in fact, there are important drug-drug interactions that should be understood related to marijuana. Marijuana can inhibit a number of important enzymes such as CYP34A as well as CYP2C9. And we know that these products can increase drug levels of common cardiovascular medications, including antiarrhythmics, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, as well as warfarin and statins. So it's important to have these in the back of your mind. And if you don't remember these interactions, work closely with your pharmacist to better understand the potential effect of marijuana on the drugs that your patients take. So just to kind of bring this all to really summary, what is our role as cardiovascular specialists in this area? Well, I would say first and most importantly is screening, particularly in younger patients who present unexpectedly, for example, with myocardial infarction or stroke. It's very important to screen for the use of marijuana or marijuana products, particularly in areas of the country where there is very high use. It's important when we talk to our patients that we ask not only about the frequency of use, but the duration of use, and specifically which products are being used. As I mentioned, some of the newer synthetic products can be extremely potent relative to some of the older, more traditional marijuana products. It's also important to take a history of other drugs of abuse, take a history related to tobacco use as well, since there can be concomitant effects, as I mentioned previously. Secondly, counseling. Counseling is extremely important. That's what we do as clinicians. And so explaining to your patient what the potential risk of these products are, how these products may interact with the other drugs that they take for their cardiovascular disease. But I think it's also important to recognize the limitations of the knowledge that we have. There is some reasonable science out there, but there's still so much that we need to learn about marijuana and its effects on the cardiovascular system. And as I said, recognizing our own limitations in our knowledge, work closely with our colleagues in pharmacy to provide counseling to both to us and to our patients regarding how marijuana can affect drug levels of their important cardiovascular medications. So just to maybe end on a positive note, what, what would I see as the next really steps in this area? And really, I would say there are three. The first is, of course, the need for guidelines. Um, I uh, spent several years um, working on and sharing guidelines of the Heart Failure Society of America. And I think it's extremely important that major cardiovascular societies get together and think about creating guidelines around this area of extreme importance to our patients with cardiovascular disease. Secondly, um, FDA regulation. The FDA needs to get involved with regulating the compounds that are on the market now, both for recreational use as well as medical use. And lastly, and importantly, we are always trying to advance science and we need further research and funding for research to better understand what the interactions are that we discussed above and also how these can impact directly on our patient's health, both in the short term and in the long term. So again, I wanna thank you for joining me this morning on the Clock Chronicles. I look forward to talking with you again in the future on other related topics. Mm -hmm.